Hello, I'm David. Here is Battlefield Bad Company 2. In my opinion, uh, best video game of all time. Um, there's been a few video games that are just really good overall to um, try to knock out the best selling games like uh, GTA San Andreas is one of them and Need for Speed Most Wanted was so packed with features in order to uh, knock out uh, San Andreas from the best selling list. Um, I'm gonna have an audiobook in the background. Uh, this is the one that took uh, Call of Duty out slowly but surely, knocked them out of the best selling game. Uh, so I don't know how the sound levels are gonna be working. I have an audiobook here called The Fundamentals of Prosperity, Roger W. Babson from the, around 1920. Uh, I could continue on that. And then there's another one with Napoleon Hill after that. The figures don't show it. Only 31 million tons were produced in 1919, compared with 39 million tons in 1916. People have forgotten the gospel of service. The producing power per man has fallen off from 15 to 20 percent. We have all been keen on developing consumption. We have devoted nine tenths of our thought, energy, and effort to developing consumption. This message is to beg of every reader to give more thought to developing production, to the reviving of a desire to produce, and the realization of joy in production. We are spending millions and millions in every city to develop the goodwill of customers, to developing customers a desire to buy. This is all well and good, but we can't continue to go in one direction indefinitely. We cannot always get steam out of the boiler without feeding the furnace. The time has come when, in our own interests, in the interests of our communities, our industry, and of the nation itself. For a while, we must stop adding more stories to this structure. Instead, we must strengthen the foundations upon which the entire structure rests. R W B. Here comes End a tank. Forward. So here's this uh, anti-tank uh, missile launcher. Chapter 1, Honesty or Steel Doors. It's a tow missile. While it's going to be shooting at me right now. percent of the people have their eyes it just took on the out, goal uh, of integrity. Uh, tank Our investments thing, so. are secure. But with 51% of them headed in the wrong direction, our investments are valueless. The first fundamental of prosperity is integrity. While on a recent visit to Chicago, I was taken by the president of one of the largest banks to see his new safety deposit vaults. He described these as bank president's will, as the largest and most marvelous vaults in the city. He expatiated on the heavy steel doors and the various electrical and mechanical contrivances which protect the stocks and bonds deposited in the institution. While at the bank, a person came in to rent a box. He made the arrangements for the box, and the box was handed to him. In it, he deposited some stocks and bonds which he took from his pocket. Then the clerk, who had charge of the vaults, went to a rack on the wall and took out a key and gave it to the man who had rented the box. Then the man put the box into one of the little steel compartments shut the door and turned the key. He then went away feeling perfectly secure on account of those steel doors and various mechanical and electrical contrivances existing to protect his wealth. I did not wish to give him a sleepless night, so I said nothing, but I couldn't help thinking how easy it would have been for that poorly paid humpbacked clerk to make a duplicate of that key before he delivered it to the renter of that box. With such a duplicate, 
The clerk could have made that man penniless within a few minutes after he had left the building. The great steel door and the electrical and mechanical contrivances would have been absolutely valueless. Of course, the point I am making is that the real security which that great bank in Chicago had to offer its clientele lay not in the massive stone columns in front of its structure, nor in the heavy steel doors, nor the electrical and mechanical contrivances. The real strength of that institution rested in the honesty, the absolute integrity of its clerks. That afternoon I was talking about the matter with a businessman. We were discussing securities, earnings, and capitalization. He seemed greatly troubled by the mass of figures before him. I said to him, Instead of pawing over these earnings and striving to select yourself the safest bond, you will do better to go to a reliable banker or bond house and leave the decision with him. Why, he said, I couldn't do that. Mr. Jones, I went on, tell me the truth. After you buy a bond or a stock certificate, do you ever take the trouble to see if it is signed and countersigned properly? Moreover, if you find it signed, is there any way by which you may know whether the signature is genuine or forged? No, he said, there isn't. I am absolutely dependent on the integrity of the bankers from whom I buy the securities. And when you think of it, there is really no value at all in the pieces of paper which one so carefully locks up in the safety deposit boxes. There is no value at all in the bank book which we so carefully cherish. There is no value at all in those deeds and mortgages upon which we depend so completely. The value rests first in the integrity of the lawyers, clerks, and stenographers who draw up the papers. Secondly, in the integrity of the officers who sign the documents. Thirdly, in the integrity of the courts and judges which would enable us to enforce our claims. And finally, in the integrity of the community which would determine whether or not the orders of the court will be executed. These things which we look upon as of great value, the stocks, bonds, bank books, deeds, mortgages, insurance policies, and so forth, are merely nothing. While 51% of the people have their eyes on the goal of integrity, our investments are secure. But with 51% of them headed in the wrong direction, our investments are valueless. So the first fundamental of prosperity is integrity. Without it, there is no civilization. There is no peace. There is no security. There is no safety. Mind you also that this applies just as much to the man who is working for wages as to the capitalist and every owner of property. Integrity, however, is very much broader than the above illustration would indicate. Integrity applies to many more things than to money. Integrity requires the seeking after as well as the dispensing of truth. It was this desire for truth which found in our educational institutions, our sciences, and our arts. All the great professions, from medicine to engineering, rest upon this spirit of integrity. Only as they so rest can they prosper or even survive. Integrity is the mother of knowledge. The desire for truth is the basis of all learning, the value of all experience, and the reason for all study and investigation. Without integrity as a basis, our entire educational system would fall to the ground. All newspapers and magazines would become sources of great danger, and the publication of books would have to be suppressed. Our whole civilization rests upon the assumption that people are honest. With this confidence shaken, the structure falls, and it should fall, or unless truth be taught, the nation would be much better off without its schools, newspapers, books, and professions. 
better have no gun at all than one aimed at yourself. The cornerstone of prosperity is the stone of integrity. End of chapter one. Chapter two, Faith, the Searchlight of Business. This religion, which we talk about for an hour a week on Sunday, is not only the vital force which protects our community, but it is the vital force which makes our community. Here's the next book, Napoleon Hill. Here begins the interview with the devil. I have uncovered the secret code by which I can pick up your thoughts. I have come to ask you some very plain questions. I demand that you give me direct and truthful answers. Are you ready for the interview, Mr. Devil? Yes, I am. But you must address me with more respect. During this interview, you will address me as your majesty. And by what right do you demand such royal respect? You should know I control 98% of the people of your world. Do you not think that entitles me to greatest royalty? Have you proof of your claim? Yes, plenty of it. Of what does your proof consist? Of many things. If you want answers, you will address me as your majesty. Some things you will understand, some you will not. In order that you may get my viewpoint, I shall describe myself and collect the false notions people have of me and my place of abode. And that is a fine idea, your majesty. Start by telling me where you live, then describe your physical appearance. My physical appearance? Why, my dear Mr. Earthbound, I have no physical body. I would be handicapped by such an encumbrance as those in which you Earthbound creatures live. I consist of negative energy, and I live in the minds of people who fear me. I also occupy one half of every atom of physical matter and every unit of mental and physical energy. Perhaps you will better understand my nature if I tell you I am the negative portion of the atom. Oh, I see what you are preparing to claim. You are laying the foundation to say that if it were not for you, there would be no world, no stars, no electrons, no atoms, no human beings, nothing. Is that correct? True. Absolutely true. Well, if you only occupy one half of energy and matter, who occupies the other half? The other half is occupied by my opposition. Opposition? What do you mean? The opposition is what you earthbound call God. So you have the universe divided up with God. Is that your claim? Not my claim, but the actual fact. Before this interview is finished, you will understand why my claim is true. You will also understand why it has to be true. Or there could be no world such as yours, no earthbound creatures such as you. I am no beast with a forked tongue and a spiked tail. But you do control the minds of 98 out of every 100 people. You said so yourself. Who causes all the misery in this 98% devil-controlled world if you do not? I have not said that I do not cause all the misery of the world. On the other hand, I boast of it. It is my business to represent the negative side of everything, including the thoughts of you earthbound people. How else can I control people? My opposition controls positive thought. I control negative thought. How do you gain control of the minds of people? Oh, that is easy. I merely move in and occupy the unused space of the human brain. I sow the seeds of negative thought in the minds of people so I can occupy and control the space. You must have many tricks and devices by which you gain and hold control of the human mind. To be sure, I employ tricks and devices to control human thought. My devices are clever ones, too. Go ahead and describe your clever tricks, Your Majesty. One of my cleverest devices for mind control is fear. I plant the seed of fear in the minds of people, and as these seeds germinate and grow, through use, I control the space they occupy. The six most effective fears are the fear of poverty, criticism, ill health, loss of love, old age, and death. Which of these six fears serves you most often, Your Majesty? The first and the last, poverty and death. At one time or another during life, I tighten my grip on all people through one or both of these. I plant these fears in the minds of people so deftly that they believe them to be their own creation. I accomplish this end by making people believe I am standing just beyond the entrance gate of the next life, waiting to claim them after death for eternal punishment. Of course, I cannot punish anyone, except in that person's own mind, through some form of fear. But fear of the thing which does not exist is just as useful to me as fear of that which does exist. All forms of fear extend the space I occupy in the human mind. Your Majesty, will you explain how you gained this control over human beings? The story is too long to be told in a few words. It began over a million years ago when the first man began to think. Up to that time I had control over all mankind, but enemies of mine discovered the power of positive thought, placed it in the minds of men, and then began a battle on my part to remain in control. So far I have uh, been the power, myself, having lost only 2%. The power of positive thinking is Napoleon Hill's, the book that he's well known for. This particular book was, uh, it wasn't released until uh, after the year 2000 even though it was written almost a hundred years before that. Um, the way that he just said deftly, uh, I read that in an article the other day, and that word deftly is most known for uh, the song um, when the, the quote in the song says, they deftly maneuver and muscle for rank. There's, there's one right there. And... Um, Fuel burning fast on an empty tank, reckless and wild, they pour through the turns. Their prowess is potent and secretly stern. The arena is empty except for one man still driving and striving as fast as he can. Alternative to the audiobook, I was going to have, uh, I was reading about that driver video game. 
and it said that uh, they were going to make it into a movie in 2006. The script was written and leaked like a year later online. It was a movie about the video game called Driver. Uh, it was the main competitor to the Grand Theft Auto series. Um, and so I wanted to see, because Driver 3 is actually pretty fun from what I saw the other day with that stuff with the lighthouse. Uh, I just saw a shadow over here. Um, he's either in this house or maybe I didn't see a shadow. Anyways, um, I was going to read the script. And instead, of, because I can't read while I'm playing video games, I was going to have it in my headset. Um, and then I was going to try to repeat it out loud. Uh, that might be a better idea to do with this book is to just unplug that, have the song, uh, Sympathy for the Devil, the Rolling Stones, I just was reminded of listening to this book. Um, mortar strikes over here. I saw, I think there's a tank back there. I don't have any kind of weaponry that would take out a tank. Um, that was just some ideas. Uh, to try to have an audiobook going in my headset and just repeat it out loud. Um, anyways, I need to take cover. Now I have a backup over here that that guy's probably going to take him out. Opposition. I take it from your answer that men who think are your enemies. Is that right? It is not right, but it is correct. But tell me something more about the world in which you live. I live wherever I choose. Time and space do not exist for me. I'm a force best described to you as energy. My favorite physical dwelling place, as I told you, is in the minds of the earthbound. I control a part of the brain space of every human being. The amount of space I occupy in each individual's mind depends upon how little and what sort of thinking that person does. As I have told you, I cannot entirely control any person who thinks. You speak of your opposition. Just what do you mean by that? My opponent controls all the positive forces of the world, such as love, faith, hope, and optimism. My opponent also controls the positive factors of all natural law throughout the universe, the forces which keep the Earth and the planets and all the stars balanced in their courses. But these forces are meek in comparison with those which operate in the human mind under my control. You see, I do not see He's being harassed by that UAV. I prefer the control of the Now that UAV is harassing me. You acquire your power. And by what means do you answer it? I add to my power by appropriating the mind power of the Earthbound as they come through the gate at the time of death. Ninety-eight out of every one hundred who come back to my plane from the Earth plane. So there's four the players on my team and five on the other. I get all who come over with any form of fear. They outrank you us. Constantly at work, there's the four maximum there, rank so on the other side and only two on Will ours. you tell me how you go about your job of preparing human minds so you can control them? I have countless ways of gaining control of human minds while they are still on the Earth plane. My greatest weapon is poverty. I deliberately discourage people from accumulating material wealth because poverty discourages men from thinking and makes them easy play for it. My next best friend is ill health. An unhealthy body discourages thinking. Then I have countless thousands of workers on Earth who aid me in gaining control of human minds. I have these agents placed in every calling. They represent oh, I just every saw one up here. and creed, every religion. Who are your greatest enemies on Earth, Your Majesty? All who inspire people to I think and I act did. on their own initiative are my enemies. Such men as Socrates, Confucius, Voltaire, Emerson, Thomas Paine, and Abraham Lincoln. And you are not doing me any good either. Is Those would all be good men books. Uh, yeah, I did see. You, it's almost 100% when I think I support, saw someone I actually did. Some wealthy men serve my cause, while others do me great damage, depending on how the wealth is used. The great Rockefeller fortune, for example, is one of my worst enemies. That is interesting, Your Majesty. Will you tell me why you fear the Rockefeller fortune more than others? The Rockefeller money is being used to isolate and conquer diseases of the physical body in all parts of the world. Disease has always been one of my most effective weapons. The fear of ill health is... Need concentration. That... Well, I really don't. I want to add in that sound from the movie The Time Machine. When there's that uh, alarm sound and all the people just sort of walk towards without thinking. That, so I'm completely exposed from the rear. Oh, okay, so I disarmed his charge and I took him out. He's going to be very angry. I'm beefing with that guy. We've exchanged a number of uh, gun battles so far. So the right side is completely clear. They're going to be coming toward the center, also known as up the gut or on the left flank. Um, there's a classic terminology from like World War II uh, the Second World War is what it's known as, of uh, the Eastern Front or something like that. 
The Lock of Bellamy is uncovering new secrets of nature in a hundred different directions, all of which are designed to help men take and keep possession of their own minds. It is encouraging new and better methods of feeding, clothing, and housing people. It is wiping out the slums in the large cities, the places where my favorite allies are found. It is financing campaigns for better government and helping to wipe out dishonesty in politics. It is helping to set higher standards in Hopefully he doesn't have C4 over here. He's getting shot from the rear. And that is I not disarmed him. That's amazing. What about these boys and girls who are said to be on the road? Astounding. Ahead? Are you in control of them? Well, I can answer that question only with yes and no. I have corrupted Who is shooting me from the rear? But they have me baffled okay. with the tendency to think for themselves. He wants to have a long distance gunfight. I'm okay with that. Cigarettes. I can understand how liquor might destroy uh, the power uh, of independent thought, but do not see what cigarettes have to do with helping your cause. If it was no easier to send a message, I would send him a message. Resistance. They destroy the power of influence. They destroy the ability to concentrate. They deaden and undermine the imaginative faculty, and help in other ways to keep people from using their minds most effectively. Do you know I have millions of people, young and old of both sexes, who smoke two packages of cigarettes a day? Do that you know the I have Muffin Man? Who are gradually destroying their power of resistance. One day I shall add to their habit of cigarette smoking other thought destroying habits until I shall have gained control of their minds. Habits come in pairs, triplets, and quadruplets. Any habit which weakens one's willpower invites a flock of its relatives to move in and take possession of the mind. The cigarette habit not only lowers the power of resistance and discourages persistence, but it invites looseness in other human relationships. I never thought that cigarettes were a tool of destruction, Your Majesty. But your explanation throws a different light on the subject. How many converts? This was written have around the time of prohibition. Millions are now victims, and the number is increasing daily. Soon I shall have most of the world indulging in the habit. In thousands of families, I now have followers of the habit, including every member of the family. Very young boys and girls are beginning to take up the habit. They are learning how to smoke by observing their parents and older brothers and sisters. Which do you consider to be your greater tool for gaining control of human minds? Cigarettes or liquor? Without hesitation, I would say cigarettes. Once I get a young person to join my tea package day club, I have no trouble in inducing that person to take on the habit of liquor, overindulgence of sex, and all other related habits which destroy independence of thought and action. I destroyed a vehicle. Your Majesty, when I began this interview, I had you all wrong. I thought you were a fraud and a fake. So there's a woman, so... Quite real and very powerful. It's you a lady, so I'll sit her an invite. Millions of people have questioned Because we're outnumbered. I got most of them at the gate as they came over. I ask no person to believe... As defenders, I that people fear being outnumbered, it really I makes a difference. Force. Begging people to believe is the business of my opposition, not mine. So we lost one of the, half rules. the objective. I would not be able to look myself in the face again if I did not tell you, here and now, that you are the damnedest fiend ever to be turned loose on innocent people. I always had a wrong conception of you. I thought you were kind enough to let people alone while they were living. That you merely tortured their souls after death. Now I learn from your own brazen confession that you destroyed their right to freedom of thought and caused them to go through a living hell on earth. What do you have to say to that? I get what I want by exercising self-control. It is not so good for my own business. But I suggest you emulate me instead of I have, uh, you call yourself a disarmed you this are. three Otherwise, times. You'll never force this interview on me. But you will never be the sort of finger that frightens me. I can't hear if it's about to. to control wow, I disarmed it Let us get three or four times. Time. I came here to learn more about you, not to discuss myself. Please go ahead and tell me of the many tricks you have devised for gaining control of the human mind. What is your most powerful weapon just now? That is a difficult question to answer. I have so many devices for Mind control is what he was saying from the beginning. Which are the most powerful? Right at the moment, I am trying to bring about another world war. My friends here in Washington are helping me to involve America in the war. If I can start the world to killing on a wholesale basis, I shall be able to put into operation my favorite device for mind control. It is what we call mass fear. I use this device to bring about the other world war in 1914. The only thing we have to fear and if are my people who are trust, afraid I would now be in possession of every man, woman, and child in the world. Fearful. You can see for yourself how your identity Whoa! <laughs> the two of them. Three of them. Three of them. Two of them. Yes, I see your point. Who went? You are a very ingenious manipulator of the minds of people. Is your devilish business carried on only through people of high position? Ah, and great tank. Intent? Oh no. I use the minds of people in all walks of life. As a matter of fact, I prefer the type of person who makes no pretense of thinking. I can manipulate that sort of person without difficulty. I could not control 98% of the people of the world if all people were skilled in thinking for themselves. I am interested in the welfare of those people whom you claim to control. Therefore, I wish you to tell me all of the tricks by which you enter and control their minds. I want a complete confession from you. So begin with your cleverest. Boom! Trick. This is suicide you are forcing on me, but I am helpless. So settle down and I will place in your hands the weapon by which millions of your fellow Earthbound will defend themselves against me. Tell me first about your most clever trick, the one you use to ensnare the greatest number of people. If you force me to give away this secret, it will mean my loss of millions of people now living, and still greater numbers of millions as yet unborn. I beg of you, permit me to pass this one question unanswered. So His Majesty the Devil fears a mere humble Earthbound creature? Is that right? It is not right, but it is true. You have no right to rob me of my most necessary tool of trade. For millions of years, I have dominated a boundary. I, ha I have to hear that again. I'm going back uh, 60, 75 seconds. I could not control 98% of the people of the world if all people were skilled in thinking for themselves. 
I'm interested in the welfare of those people whom you claim to control. Willpower. Therefore, I wish you to tell me all of the tricks by which you enter and control their minds. I want a complete confession from you, so begin with your cleverest trick. This is suicide, you are forcing on me, but I am helpless. So settle down and I will place in your hands the weapon by which millions of your fellow Earthbound will defend themselves against me. Yeah, The Power of Positive Thinking is one of the books that he wrote. Napoleon Hill, I mean. So Napoleon Hill was just sort of a regular salesman who became one of the best-selling authors. Um, what he did was he would interview uh, the richest people in America like uh, Andrew Carnegie and others. And he would take those interviews and distill them into uh, ideas and concepts of uh, how, you know, Think and Grow Rich is one of his books. Um, but I'm just trying to understand what that statement was there. Anyways, I don't know. Tell me first about your most clever trick, the one you use to ensnare the greatest number of people. If you force me to give away this secret, it will mean my loss of millions of people now living, and still greater numbers of your losers yet unborn. I beg of you, permit me to pass this one question unanswered. So His Majesty the Devil fears a mere humble earthbound creature? Is that right? It is not right, but it is true. You have no right to rob me of my most necessary tool of trade. For millions of years, I have dominated those bad creatures through fear and ignorance. Now you, come along, would destroy my use of these weapons by forcing me to tell how I use them. Do you not realize that you will break my grip on every person who heeds this confession you are forcing from me? Ooh. Have you no mercy? Have you no sense of humor? Have you no sport? It's my ship. I suppose the internet is breaking down. Stop. Where's that UAV though? I just saw the Hellfire missile come down. This stuff is so chaotic. All the people are gonna leave. Um, they like to bully on that side of the thing. Why is the video not working? The book? Oh, uh, it's not responding. so chaotic, I have no idea where anyone is. There's at least one. I just saw the Hellfire missile again. Where's the UAV? So if we disarmed it now, I'll definitely be uh, in the game more. Okay, tank is destroyed. Somehow I'm still walking around. Um, so, I'm gonna reload YouTube. I hear another Hellfire. There it is. I saw, I saw the UAV. So I'm gonna, uh, pick up my squad mate over here, and then I'm gonna take out that UAV. Who's shooting at us? Is he, he's angry at me for reviving him. That's like the one feature that, so here I see the Hellfire coming in, it's not going to hit me with it. Good luck. Oh. There's a machine gun here, so if that, whatever, my handheld machine gun wasn't going to take him out, this one definitely will. So he's using the, the zoom feature on that UAV over there. At least I've got him pinned down. So is there, now there's a sniper shooting at me from right there at that bus? Okay, um, I'm gonna put on that Rolling Stones song. I rode a tank, held general's rank in the Blitzkrieg raid. And something else.
Okay. Uh, Sympathy for the Devil cover. Now I can change the language for voice searches? What does that mean? Acoustic cover? No. to that book that I just had going. Sex and all other related habits which destroy independence of so thought and action. Your Majesty, when I began this interview, I had you all wrong. I thought you were a fraud and a fake, but I see now that you are quite real and very powerful. Your apology is accepted, but you need not bother. Millions of people have questioned my power, and I got most of them at the gate as they came over. I ask no person to believe in me. I prefer that people fear me. I am no better. I take what I want by cleverness and force. Begging people to believe is the business of my opposition, not mine. Your Majesty will please pardon my rudeness, but I would not be able to look myself in the face again if I did not tell you, here and now, that you are the damnedest fiend ever to be turned loose on innocent people. I always had a wrong conception of you. I thought you were kind enough to let people alone while they were living, that you merely tortured their souls after death. Now I learn from your own brazen confession that you destroyed their right to freedom of thought and caused them to go through a living hell on earth. What do you have to say to that? I get what I want by exercising self-control. It is not so good for my own business. But I suggest you emulate me instead of criticizing me. You call yourself a thinker, and you are. Otherwise, you would never have forced this interview on me. But you will never be the sort of thinker that frightens me unless you gain and exercise greater control over your own emotions. Let us get away from personalities. I came here to learn more about you, not to discuss myself. Please go ahead and tell me of the many tricks you have devised for gaining control of the human mind. What is your most powerful weapon just now? That is a difficult question to answer. I have so many devices for entering human minds and controlling them that it is difficult to say which are the most powerful. Right at the moment, I am trying to bring about another world war. My friends here in Washington are helping me to involve America in the war. If I can start the world to killing on a wholesale basis, I shall be able to put into operation my favorite device for mind control. It is what you call mass fear. I used this device to bring about the other world war in 1940. I used it to bring about the economic depression in 1929. And if my opposition had not double-crossed me, I would now be in possession of every man, woman, and child in the world. You can see for yourself how near I came to world domination. The thing I have been struggling to attain for thousands of years. Yes, I see your point. Who wouldn't? You are a very ingenious manipulator of the minds of people. Is your devilish business carried on only through people of high position and great influence? Oh, no. I use the minds of people in all walks of life. As a matter of fact, I prefer the type of person who makes no pretense of thinking. I can manipulate that sort of person without difficulty. I could not control 98% of the people of the world if all people were skilled in thinking for themselves. I am interested in the welfare of those people whom you claim to control. Therefore, I wish you to tell me all of the tricks by which you enter and control their minds. I want a complete confession from you, so begin with your cleverest trick. This is suicide you are forcing on me, but I am helpless. So settle down and I will place in your hands the weapon by which millions of your Kincaid. fellow Earth will defend themselves against me. Advance toward the enemy. Tell me first about your most Encampment. clever trick, the Kincaid. one you used to ensnare the greatest number of people. If you force me to give away this secret, it will mean my loss of millions of people now living, Kincaid. and still greater numbers Crouch of millions of your down. I beg of you, permit me to pass this one question unanswered. So his majesty the devil fears a mere humble earthbound creature? Is that right? It is not right, but it's true. You have no right to rob me of my most necessary tool of trade. For millions of years I have dominated earthbound creatures through fear and ignorance. Now you, come along, would destroy my use of these weapons by forcing me to tell how I use them. Do you not realize that you will break my grip on every person who heeds this confession you are forcing from me? Have you no mercy? Have you no sense of humor? Have you no sportsmanship? Stop stalling and start confessing. Who are you to ask mercy of one whom you would destroy if you could? Who are you to talk of sportsmanship and a sense of humor? You, who by your own confession have set up a living hell. Okay, you're stalling. Innocent people through their fears and ignorance. And as for minding my own business, that is just what I'm doing when I force you to tell how you control people through their own minds. My business, if it can be called a business, is helping to unlock the doors of the self-made prisons in which men and women are confined because of the fears you have planted in their minds. My greatest weapon over human beings consists of two secret principles by which I gain control of their minds. 
I must be first of the principle of habit, through which I silently enter the minds of people. By operating through this principle, I establish, I wish I could avoid using this word, the habit of drifting. When a person begins to drift on any subject, he is headed straight toward the gates of what you earthbound call hell. Describe all the ways in which you induce people to drift. Define the word and tell us exactly what you mean by it. I can best define the word drift by saying that people who think for themselves never drift, while those who do little or no thing for themselves are drifters. A drifter is one who permits himself to be influenced and controlled by circumstances outside of his own mind. He would rather let me occupy his mind and do his thinking than go to the trouble of thinking for himself. A drifter is one who accepts whatever life throws in his way without making a protest or putting off fight. He doesn't know what he wants from life and spends all of his time getting just that. A drifter has lots of opinions, but they are not his own. Most of them are supplied by me. A drifter is one who is too lazy mentally to use his own brain. That is the reason I can take control of people's thinking and plant my own ideas in their minds. I think I understand what a drifter is. Tell me the exact habits of people by which you induce them to drift through life. Start by telling me when and how you first gain control of a person's mind. My control over the mind of a human being is obtained while the person is young. Sometimes I lay the foundation for my control of the mind before the owner of it is born, by manipulating the minds of that person's parents. Sometimes I go further back than this and prepare people for my control through what you have found called physical heredity. You see, therefore, I have two approaches to the mind of a person. Yes, go on, and describe these two doors by which you enter and control the minds of human beings. As I have stated, I help to bring people into your world with weak brains by giving to them before her as many as possible of the weaknesses of their ancestors. You call this principle physical heredity. After people are born, I make use of what you earthbound call environment as a means of controlling them. This is where the principle of habit enters. The mind is nothing more than the sum total of one's habits. One by one, I enter the mind and establish habits, which lead finally to my absolute domination of the mind. Tell me the most common habits by which you control the minds of people. That is one of my cleverest tricks. I enter the minds of people through thoughts which they believe to be their own. Those most useful to me are fear. There's a sniper somewhere. Greed, lust, revenge, anger, I don't vanity, see him though. And laziness. Through one or more of these, I can enter any mind at any age. But I get my best results when I take charge of a mind while it is young, before its owner has learned how to close any of these nine doors. Then I can set up habits which keep the doors ajar for Wow, there's four, four guys right now, there. Let us go back to the habit of drifting. Tell us all about that habit, since you say it is your cleverest trick in controlling the minds of people. As I They're using before, smoke I grenades. Drift and their youth. I induce them to drift so through school without knowing what occupation they wish to follow yeah. up. Here I catch the majority of people. Habits are related. Drift in one direction and soon you will be drifting in all directions. I also use environmental habits to give me a definite grip on my business. I see. You make it your Back business your to train children in the habit of drifting by inducing them to go through school without any more purpose. Now, tell me of some of your other tricks with which you cause people to become drifters. Well, my second best trick in developing the habit of drifting is one that I put into operation with the aid of parents He's still and shooting, students, uh, religious instructors. Uh, smoke I will grenades. Not to force guys. you to mention this trick. Do not disclose this trick. If There's you yourself, you at least one, one sniper that was taking shots history. at me. If you publish this confession in book form, you will be barred from the public schools. It will be blacklisted by most of the religious leaders. It will be hidden from children by many parents. The newspapers will not dare to give reviews of your book. Millions Speaking of, of uh, I don't know. I, I just learned yesterday that uh, the oldest uh, public school, private school or something, is from the year 1630, and that was within 10 years of the founding of Harvard. So the first uh, secondary school um, is, you know, almost as old as Harvard. And something like seven of the signers of the Declaration of Independence all went to the same secondary school. And um, I don't know, that's just what I learned yesterday. So is that that same sniper? I'm gonna restart the book. Kincaid advance toward the boat. In fact, no one will like you or your book except those who think, and you know how very few there are of this sort. My advice to you is to let me speak the description of my second best trick. So Kincaid for retreat good, towards the objective. The of your second best trick. No one will like and my book except those who think. Disarm the explosive charge. Oh, yeah, go ahead and answer. Kincaid. You'll regret this, Mr. Pound, but the joke is on you. By this Smoke mistake, everywhere. You divert attention from me. Yourself. Throw a med my kit. Kincaid, no. And hate you for uncovering my magic. Never mind about me. Tell me all about this second best trick of yours. With so which you I'm still going to have first place even if we my lose. My second best trick is not second at all. It is first. 4, it is first points. because without it, I never could gain control of the minds of the youths. Parents, school teachers, religious instructors, and many other adults unknowingly serve my I got first place. I'm going to destroy your children the habit of thinking for themselves. They go about their work in various ways, never suspecting what they are doing to the minds of children or the real cause of the children's mistakes. I can hardly believe you, Your Majesty. I've always believed the children's best friends were those closest to them, their parents, their school teachers, and their religious instructors. Where would children go for dependable guidance if not to those who have charge of them? That is where my cleverness comes in. There is the exact explanation of how I control 98% of the people of the world. 
I take possession of people during their youth, before they come into possession of their own lives, by using those who are in charge of them. I especially need the help of those who give children their religious instruction, because it is here that I break down independent thought and start We're to defending the again, that's okay. confusing their minds with unproven uh, ideas concerning a world of which they know nothing. Nine verse nine, also, it's probably the minds of a lot of people are going to leave. Fears, the fear of hell. I understand that it is easy for you to frighten children with threats of hell, but how do you continue to make them fear you and your hell after they grow up and learn to think for themselves? Children grow up, but they do not always learn to think for themselves. Once I capture the mind of a child through fear, I weaken that child's ability to reason and to think for himself, and that weakness goes with the child all through life. Is that not taking unfair advantage of a human being by contaminating his mind before he comes into full possession of it? Everything is fair that I can use to further my ends. I have no foolish limitations of right and wrong. Might is right with me. I use every known human weakness to gain and keep control of the human mind. I understand your devilish nature. Now, let us get back to further discussion of your methods of inducing people to drift to hell here on Earth. From your confession, I see that you take charge of children while their minds are young and pliable. Tell me more of how you use parents, teachers, and religious leaders to ensnare people into drifting. One of my favorite tricks is to coordinate the efforts of parents and religious instructors, so they work together in helping me to destroy the children's power to think for themselves. I use many religious instructors to undermine the courage and power of independent thought of children by teaching them to fear them. But I use parents to aid the religious leaders in this great work of mine. How do parents help religious leaders destroy their children's power to think for themselves? I never heard of such a monstrosity. I accomplished this through a very clever trick. I caused the parents to teach their children to believe as the parents do in connection with religion, politics, marriage, and other important subjects. In this way, as you can see, when I gain control of the mind of a person, I can easily perpetuate the control by causing that person to help me fasten it upon the minds of his offspring. In what other ways do you use parents to convert children into drifters? I cause children to become drifters by following the example of their parents, most of whom I have already taken over and bound eternally to my call. In some parts of the world, I gain mastery over children's minds and subdue their willpower in exactly the same way that men break and subdue animals of lower intelligence. It makes no difference to me how a child's will is subdued, as long as it fears something. I will enter its mind through that fear and limit the child's power to think and think. It seems that you go out of your way to keep people from thinking. Yes. Accurate thought is death to me. I cannot exist in the minds of those who think accurately. I do not mind people thinking, as long as they think in terms of fear, discouragement, hopelessness, and destructiveness. When they begin to think in constructive terms of faith, courage, hope, and definiteness of purpose, they immediately become allies of my opposition, and are therefore lost to me. I am beginning to understand how you gain control of the minds of children through the help of their parents and religious instructors, but I do not see how the school teachers help you in this damnable work. School teachers help me gain control of the minds of children, not so much by what they teach the children, as because of what they do not teach them. The entire public school system is so administered that it helps my cause by teaching children almost everything except how to use their own minds and think independently. I live in fear that someday some courageous person will reverse the present system of school teaching and deal my cause of death blow by allowing the students to become their instructors, using those who now serve as teachers only as guides to help the children establish ways and means of developing their own minds from within. When that time comes, the school teachers will no longer belong to my staff. I was under the impression that the purpose of all schooling was to help children to think. That may be the purpose of schooling, but the system in most of the schools of the world does not carry out the purpose. School children are taught not to develop and use their own minds, but to adopt and use the thoughts of others. This sort of schooling destroys the capacity for independent thought, except in a few rare cases where the children rely so definitely upon their own willpower that they refuse to allow others to do their thinking. Accurate thought is the business of my opposition, not mine. What relationship, if any, has your opposition with the homes, the churches, and the schools? Your reply to this question should be interesting. Here is where I make use of some more of my clever tricks. I cause it to appear that everything done by the parents, the school teachers, and the religious instructors is being done by my opposition. This diverts attention from me, while I manipulate the minds of the young. When religious instructors try to teach children the virtues of my opposition, they generally do so by frightening them with my name. That is all I ask of them. I kindle the flame of fear into proportions which destroy the child's power to think accurately. In the public schools, the teachers further my cause by keeping the children so busy cramming non-essential information into their minds, they have no opportunity to think accurately or to analyze correctly the things their instructors teach them. Do you claim for your cause all those who are bound by the habit of drifting? No. Drifting is only one of my tricks through which I take over the power of independent thought. Before a drifter becomes my permanent property, I, I want to him on and <clears throat> snare him with I want to capture this. I will tell you about this. Right here, this radio tower, in my opinion, is copy and pasted from Need for Speed Most Wanted at the police HQ. They have the radio tower and in Need for Speed Most Wanted on PlayStation 2, the way it works is there's no like weapons in the game it's just the car is able to crash into certain things and make them fall down and um this frostbite engine this game bad company battlefield is known as the first game to use the frostbite game engine um and eventually need for speed the run used frostbite but after this next objective we lose I want to I capture that.
on video because it, I think uh, Need for Speed Most Wanted on PlayStation 2 is actually the first Frostbite game um, or whatever. So anything with Frostbite is sort of the secret weapon of Electronic Arts in order to knock out competi uh, competitor video game developers who are in the best selling uh, spot like Grand Theft Auto San Andreas was and uh, Call of Duty was, that's Activision Blizzard and Grand Theft Auto's Rockstar games, those are separate from Electronic Arts. Electronic Arts is like the one that started it all, the Sim City, that was the best selling game the first best-selling game way back in the day in the early 90s and a lot of the SimCity uh, developing tools are used to create the games where we have a first-person objective like a smaller perspective it's not a trick after I finish describing my methods of converting people into drifters do you mean you have a method by which you can cause people to drift so far away from self-determination that they can never save themselves yes a definite method and it's so effective it never fails do I understand you to claim your method is so powerful your opposition cannot reclaim those whom you have permanently ensnared through drifting I claim just that do you think I would control so many people if my opposition could That's my controller Nothing drifting. It's not, it's not uh, doing anything. Nothing can stop me except the power of accurate thought. People who think accurately do not drift on any subject. They recognize the power of their own minds. Moreover, they take over that power and yield it to no person or influence. But go ahead and tell me more of the methods by which you cause people to drift to hell with you. I cause people to drift tell on every more, subject in which I can control me more. Power and action. Take the subject of health, for example. I cause most people to eat too much food, and the wrong sort of food. This leads to indigestion and destroys the power of accurate thought. If the public schools and the churches taught children more about proper eating, they would do my cause irreparable damage. Marriage. I cause men and women to drift into marriage without plan or purpose designed to convert the relationship into harmony. Here is one of my most effective methods of converting people into the habit of drifting. I cause married people to bicker and nag one another over money matters. I cause them to quarrel over the bringing up of their children. I engage them in unpleasant controversies over their intimate relationships and in disagreements over friends and social activities. I keep them so busy finding fault with one another that they never have time to do anything else long enough to break the habit of drifting. Occupation. I teach people to become drifters by causing them to drift out of school into the first job they can find, with no definite aim or purpose except to make a living. Through this trick, I keep millions of people in fear of poverty all their lives. Through this fear, I lead them slowly but surely. Alright, here it goes. It's gonna the crash. Which no individual ever has and it's the same the animation. Savings. I cause people to spend Here's the same the animation same from uh, Need for Speed Most Wanted. When the player hits the radio tower, I think when the other players start advancing this way, that's when it uh, collapses. This is one of the maps from single player, um, especially in Bad Company 1 and in Bad Company 2. If we could have access as in multiplayer to the maps of the single player, that would be awesome. So there it goes. It appears that, uh, so it's called Destruction 2.0. So if someone's inside one of these houses and it gets destroyed, it's called Destruction 2.0 is the reason that uh, they lost their life, their player lost his life. Like it says right there, the PKM is the reason that he just lost his life. Um, until I, I don't remember what I was saying. For their fear of poverty. Environment. I cause people to drift into inharmonious and unpleasant environments in the home, in their places of occupation, in their relationship with relatives and acquaintances, and to remain there until I claim them through the habit of drifting. Dominating thoughts. I cause people to drift into the habit of thinking negative thoughts. This leads to negative acts and involves people in controversies and fills their minds with fears, thus paving the way for me to enter and control their minds. When I move in, I do so by appealing to people through negative thoughts, which they believe to be their own. I plant the seeds of negative thought in the minds of people through the pulpit, the newspapers, the moving pictures, the radio, and all other popular methods of appeal to the mind. Radio. I cause people to allow me to do their moving thinking for pictures. them because they are too lazy and too indifferent to think for themselves. I conclude from what you say that drifting and procrastination uh, are the same. Almost one hour. Is correct. Any habit which causes one to procrastinate, to put off reaching a definite decision, leads to the habit of drifting. Is man the only creature who drifts? Yes. All other creatures move in response to definite laws of nature. Man alone defies nature's laws and drifts or wills. Everything outside the minds of men is controlled by my opposition, by laws so definite that drifting is impossible. I control the minds of men solely because of their habit of drifting, which is only another way of saying that I control the minds of men only because they neglect or refuse to control and use their own minds. This is getting to be pretty deep stuff for a mere human being. Let us get back to the discussion of something less abstract. Please tell me how this drifting habit affects people in the everyday walks of life, and tell me in terms the average person can understand. 
I would prefer to keep this interview up among the stars. No doubt you would. That would save you from being exposed. But let us come back to Earth. Tell me now what drifting is doing to us as a nation here in the United States. Frankly, I may as well tell you that I hate the United States as only the devil can hate. That is interesting. What is the cause of this hatred? The cause was born on July 4, 1776, when 56 men signed a document which destroyed my chances of controlling the nation. You know that document is the Declaration of Independence. Had it not been for the influence of that damnable document, I would now have a dictator running the country, and I would stop this right to free speech and independent thought that is threatening my rule on Earth. Am I to understand from what you say that nations controlled by self-appointed dictators belong in your camp? There are no self-appointed dictators. I appoint them all. Moreover, I manipulate them and direct them in their work. Nations, run by my dictators, know what they want and take it by force. Look what I have done through Mussolini in Italy. Look what I am doing through Hitler in Germany. Look what I am doing through Stalin in Russia. My dictators run those nations for me because the people have been subdued through the habit of drifting. My dictators do no drifting. That is why they rule for me the millions of people under their control. What would happen if Mussolini, Stalin, and Hitler turned traitors and disavowed you and your rule? That will not happen because I have them too well bribed. I am paying each of them with the sop of his own vanity by making him believe he is acting on his own account. That is another trick of mine. Let us come back to the United States and learn something of what you are doing to convert people into the habit of drifting. Right now I am paving the way for a dictatorship by sowing the seeds of fear and uncertainty in minds of the people. Through whom are you carrying on your work? Mainly through the president. I am destroying his influence with the people by causing him to drift on the question of a working agreement between employers and their employees. If I can induce him to drift for another year, he will be so thoroughly discredited I can hand over the country to a dictator. If the president continues to drift, I will paralyze personal freedom in the United States just as I destroyed it in Spain, Italy, Germany, and England. What you say leads me to the conclusion that drifting is a weakness which inevitably ends in failure, whether among individuals or nations. Is that your claim? Drifting is the most common cause of failure in every walk of life. I can control anyone whom I can induce to form the habit of drifting on any subject. The reason for this is twofold. First, the drifter is just so much putty in my hands to be molded into whatever pattern I choose, because drifting destroys the power of individual initiative. Second, the drifter cannot get help from my opposition, because the opposition is not attracted to anything so soft and useless. Is that why a few people are wealthy while the majority of people are poor? That is exactly the reason. Poverty, like physical illness, is a contagious disease. You'll find it always among the drifters, never among those who know what they want and are determined to get just that. It may mean something to you when I call your attention to the fact that the non-drifters, whom I do not control, and those who possess most of the wealth of the world, happen to be the same people. I have always understood that money was the root of all evil, that the poor and the meek would inherit heaven, while the wealthy would pass into your hands. What have you to say of that claim? Men who know how to get the material things of life generally know how to keep out of the hands of the devil as well. The ability to acquire things is contagious. Drifters acquire nothing except that which no one else wants. If more people had definite aims and stronger desires for material and spiritual riches, I would have fewer victims. I assume, from what you say, that you do not claim fellowship with the industrial leaders. Evidently, they are not friends of yours? Friends of mine. I'll tell you what sort of friends of mine they are. They have belted the entire country with good roads, thus bringing into close communion the people of both city and country. They have converted ores into steel, with which they have built the skeletons of great skyscrapers. They have harnessed electrical power and converted it into a thousand uses, all designed to give man time to think. They have provided through the automobile personal transportation to the humblest citizen, thus giving to everyone the freedom of travel. They have provided every home with instantaneous news of what is happening in all parts of the world through the aid of the radio. They have reared libraries in every city, town, and hamlet, and have filled them with books, giving to all who read a complete outline of the most useful knowledge mankind has gathered from his experiences. They have given the humblest citizen the right to express his own opinion on any subject at any time. Libraries! Fear of molestation. And they have to it that every citizen may help make his own laws, levy his own taxes, and manage his own country through the ballot. These are but some of the things the industrial leaders have done to give every citizen the privilege of becoming a non-drifter. Do you think these men have helped my cause? Who are some of the present-day non-drifters over whom you have no control? I have control over no non-drifter, present or past. I control the weak, not those who think for themselves. Go ahead and describe a typical drifter. Give your description point by point so I can recognize a drifter in the scene. The first thing you will notice about a drifter is his total lack of a major purpose in life. He will be conspicuous by his lack of self-confidence. He will never accomplish anything in quite thought and effort. He spends all he earns and more, too, if he can get credit. He will be sick or ailing from some real or imaginary cause, and call into high heaven if he suffers the least physical pain. He will have little or no imagination. He will lack enthusiasm and initiative to begin anything he is not forced to undertake. And he will plainly express his weakness by taking the line of least resistance whenever he can do so. He will be ill-tempered and lacking in control over his emotions. His personality will be without magnetism, and it will not attract other people. He will have opinions on everything but accurate knowledge of nothing. He may be jack of all trades, but good at none. He will neglect to cooperate with those around him, even those on whom he must depend for food and shelter. He will make the same mistake over and over again, never profiting by failure. He will be narrow-minded and intolerant on all subjects, ready to crucify those who may disagree with him. He will expect everything of others, but be willing to give little or nothing in return. He may begin many things, but he will complete nothing. He will be loud in his condemnation of his government, but he will never tell you definitely how it can be improved. He will never reach decisions on anything if he can avoid it, and if he is forced to decide, he will reverse himself at the first opportunity. 
He will eat too much and exercise too little. He will take a drink of liquor if someone else will pay for it. He will gamble if he can do it on the cuff. He will criticize others who are succeeding in their chosen calling. In brief, the drifter will work harder to get out of thinking than most others work in earning a good living. He will tell a lie rather than admit his ignorance on any subject. If he works for others, he will criticize them to their backs and flatter them to their faces. You have given me a graphic description of the drifter. Please now describe the non-drifter so that I may recognize him on sight. The first sign of a non-drifter is this. He is always engaged in doing something definite, through some well-organized plan which is definite. He has a major goal in life toward which he is always working, and many minor goals, all of which lead toward his central scheme. The tone of his voice, the quickness of his step, the sparkle in his eyes, the quickness of his decisions clearly mark him as a person who knows exactly what he wants and is determined to get it, no matter how long it may take or what price he must pay. If you ask him questions, he gives you direct answers and never falls back on evasions or resorts to subterfuge. He extends many favors to others, but accepts favors sparingly, or not at all. He will be found up front, whether he is playing a game or fighting a war. If he does not know the answers, he will say so, frankly. He has a good memory, never offers an alibi for his shortcomings. He never blames others for his mistakes, no matter if they deserve the blame. He used to be known as a go-getter, but in modern times he is called a go-giver. You will find him running the biggest business in town, living on the best street, driving the best automobile, and making his presence felt wherever he happens to be. He is an inspiration to all who come into contact with his mind. The major distinguishing feature of the non-drifter is this. He has a mind of his own and uses it for all purposes. Is the non-drifter born with some mental, physical, or spiritual advantage not available to the drifter? No. The major difference between the drifter and the non-drifter is something equally available to both. It is simply the prerogative right of each to use his own mind and think for himself. What brief message would you send to the typical drifter if you wish to cure him of this evil habit? I would admonish him to wake up and give. Give what? Some form of service useful to as many people as possible. So the non-drifter is supposed to give, is he? Yes, if he expects to get. And he must give before he gets. Some people doubt that you exist. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you. Those who are ready to be converted from the habit of drifting will recognize the authenticity of this interview by its soundness of counsel. The others are not worth the trouble it would take to convert them. Why do you not try to stop me from publishing this confession I'm wringing from you? Because that would be the surest of all ways to guarantee you will publish it. I have a better plan than trying to suppress publication of my confession. I will urge you to go ahead with the publication, then sit back and watch you suffer when some of my faithful drifters begin to make things hot for you. I will not need to deny your story. My followers will do that for me. See if they don't. If this confession of yours stopped right here, your statement would be sent. But fortunately for millions of your victims who will gain their release because of your confession, this interview will continue until you have supplied me with the weapon by which you will eventually be restrained from domination of people through their fears and superstitions. Remember, Your Majesty, your confession has just begun. After I wring from you a description of the methods by which you control people, I will force you also to give the formula by which your control can be broken at will. It is true I shall not remain here long enough to defeat you, but the published word I leave behind you will be deathless because it will consist of truth. You fear the opposition of no individual, because you know it will be short. But you do fear truth. You will fear truth and nothing else, for the reason it is slowly but definitely giving human beings freedom from all manner of fear. Without the weapon of fear, you would be helpless and entirely unable to control any human being. Is that true or false? I have no alternative but to admit that what you say is true. Now that we understand each other, let us go ahead with your confession. But before we continue, I may as well take time out to do a little boasting on my own account, now that you have had your fling at it. I will confine myself to one question, the answer to which will give me all the satisfaction I want. Is it not true that you control only the minds of those who have allowed the drifting habit to be fixed upon them? Yes, that is true. I have already admitted this truth in a dozen or more different ways. Why do you tantalize me by repeating the question? There is power in repetition. I am forcing you to repeat the highlights of your confession in as many different ways as possible, so your victims may check this interview and determine its soundness by their own experiences with you. That is one of my little tricks. Do you approve of my method? You couldn't be setting a trap for me for the purpose of doing some more boasting, could you? I am asking the questions, and you are doing the answer. Go ahead now and confess why you are powerless to stop me from forcing this confession from you. I want your confession for aid and comfort to victims of yours whom I intend to release from your control the moment they leave your confession. I am powerless to influence or control you because you have found the secret approach to my kingdom. You know that I exist only in the minds of people who have ears. You know that I control only the drifters who neglect to use their own minds. You know that my hell is here on earth and not in the world that comes after death. And you know also that drifters supply all the fire I use in my hell. You know that I am a principle or a form of energy which expresses the negative side of matter and energy, and that I am not a person with a forked tongue and a spiked tail. You have become my master because you have mastered all your fears. Lastly, you know that you can release all of my earthbound victims whom you contact, and this definite knowledge is the blow with which you will deal with the greatest damage. I cannot control you because you have discovered your own mind, and you have taken charge of it. There, now, Mr. Earthbound, that confession should beat your vanity to the bursting point. That last dart was unnecessary. Knowledge of the sort I have used to master you does not contaminate itself with vulgar indulgence and vanity. Truth is the one and only thing in the world that can stand ridicule. Now let us continue with your confession. What is wrong with the principle of flattery? You use it, do you not? Do I use it? Man alive, flattery is one of my most useful weapons. With this deadly instrument, I slay the big ones and the little ones. Your admission interests me. Go ahead now and tell me how you make use of flattery. 
I make use of it in so many ways it is difficult to know where to begin. I warn you, before I answer in detail, that publishing my answers will bring down an avalanche of ridicule on your head for bringing up the question. I'll take the responsibility. Proceed. Well, I may as well here admit that you have stumbled onto the major secret of how I convert people to the habit of drinking. That is a startling admission. Go ahead with your confession, and stick strictly to this subject of flattery. No more side remarks and no more facetiousness for the present. Tell me all about your use of flattery and gaining control over people. Flattery is a bait of incomparable value to all who wish to gain control over others. It has powerful pulling qualities because it operates through two of the most common human weaknesses, vanity and egotism. There is a certain amount of vanity and egotism in everyone. In some people, these qualities are so pronounced, they literally serve as a rope by which one may be bound. The best of all ropes is flattery. Flattery is the chief bait through which men seduce women. Sometimes, in fact, frequently, women use the same bait to gain control of men, especially men who cannot be mastered through sex appeal. I teach its use to both men and women. Flattery is the chief bait with which my agents weave their way into the confidence of people from whom they procure information needed to carry on warfare. Wherever anyone stops to feed his vanity on flattery, I move in and begin to build another drifter. Non-drifters are not easily flattered. I inspire people to use flattery in every human relationship where its use is possible, because those who are influenced by it become easy victims of the drifting habit. Can you control anyone who is amenable to flattery? Very easily. As I have already told you, flattery is of major importance in alluring people into the habit of drifting. At what age are people most susceptible to flattery? Age has nothing to do with one's susceptibility to flattery. People respond to it in one way or another from the time they become conscious of their own existence until they die. Through what motive can women be most easily flattered? Their vanity. Tell a woman she is pretty or that she wears clothes well. What motive is most effective in harpooning men? Egotism, with a capital E. Tell a man he has a strong Herculean body or that he is a great business tycoon, and he will purr like a cat and smile like an opossum. After that, you know what happens. Are all men like that? Oh, no. Two out of every hundred have their egotism so thoroughly under control that even an expert flatterer couldn't get under their skins with a double-edged butcher knife. How does a cunning woman apply her art of flattery in attracting men? Great heavens, man, do I have to draw a picture of her method for you? Have you no imagination? Oh, yes, I have imagination enough, Your Majesty. But I'm thinking of the poor dupes of the world who need to understand the exact technique with which they may be flattered into the habit of drifting. Go on and tell us how a woman can harpoon rich and presumably smart men. This is a devilish trick to play on women. But since you demand the information, I am helpless to withhold it. Women influence men through a technique consisting first of ability to inject soft, cooing baby tones into their voices, and second, by closing their eyes into a half-closed position which registers hypnotism in connection with the flattery of men. Is that all there is to the business of flattery? No, that is only the technique. Then comes the motive a woman uses as a lure. The type of woman you perhaps have in mind never sells a man herself or anything she can give him. Instead, she sells him his own egotism. Is that all that women use when they wish to flatter men? That is the most effective thing they use. It works when sex appeal fails. So, I am to believe that big, strong, smart There's men two guys going for that objective alpha. Just as if they were so much putty? Is that possible? Is it possible? They're in that house right every there. Of the day. Moreover, unless they are non-drifters, the they go? come, the harder they fall when the expert flatterer moves in on. And tell me of some of your other tricks with which you cause people to drift in life. One of my most effective devices is failure. The majority of people begin to drift as soon as they meet with opposition, and not one out of 10,000 will keep oh, on trying to fail two or three times. So it is your business to induce people to fail whenever you can. Is that correct? You have a grind. Failure breaks down one's morale, destroys self-confidence, subdues enthusiasm, dulls imagination, and drives away definiteness of purpose. Without these qualities, no one can permanently succeed in any undertaking. The world has produced thousands of inventors with abilities superior to that of the late Thomas A. Edison, but these men have never been heard of. While the name of Edison will go marching on, because Edison converted failure into a stepping stone to achievement, while the others used it as an alibi for not producing results. Is the capacity to surmount failure without being discouraged one of Henry Ford's chief assets? About yes. an hour. And this same quality is Past the chief asset of every man who attains outstanding success in any calling. That statement covers lots of territory, Your Majesty. Do you not wish to modify it or tone it down a bit for the sake of accuracy? No modification is necessary, because the claim is none too broad. Search accurately into the lives of men and women who achieve enduring success, and you will find without exception that their success has been in exact proportion to the extent that they surmounted failure. The life of every successful person loudly acclaims that which every true philosopher knows. Every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent success. But the seed will not germinate and grow under the influence of a drifter. It springs to life only when it is in the hands of one who recognizes that most failures are only temporary defeat, and who never, under any circumstances, accepts defeat as an excuse for drifting. If I understand you correctly, you claim there is virtue in failure. That does not seem reasonable. Why do you try to induce people to fail if there is virtue in failure? There is no inconsistency in my claim. The appearance of inconsistency is due to your lack of understanding. Failure is a virtue only when it does not lead one to quit trying and begin drifting. I induce as many people as I can to fail as often as possible, for the reason that not one out of 10,000 will keep on trying after failing two or three times. I am not concerned about the few who convert failures into stepping stones, because they belong to my opposition anyway. They are the non-drifters, and therefore they are beyond my reach. Your explanation clears up the matter. Now go ahead and tell me of some of your other tricks with which you allure people into drifting. One of my most effective tricks is known to you as propaganda. This is the instrument of greatest value to me in sending people to murdering one another under the guise of war. 
The cleverness of this trick consists mainly of the subtlety with which I use it. I mix propaganda with the news of the world. I have it taught in public and private schools. I see that it finds its way into the pulpit. I color moving pictures with it. I see that it enters every home where there is a radio. I inject it into billboard, newspaper, and radio advertising. I spread it in every place of business where people work. I use it to fill the divorce courts, and I make it serve to destroy business and industry. It is my chief instrument for starting runs on banks. My propagandists cover the world so thoroughly that I can start epidemics of disease, turn loose the dogs of war, or throw business into a panic at will. If you can do all that you claim with propaganda, it is no wonder that we have wars and business depressions. Give me a simple description of what you mean by the term propaganda. Just what is it, and how does it work? I wish to know particularly how you cause people to drift through the use of this devilish device. Propaganda is any device, plan, or method by which people can be influenced without knowing that they are being influenced, or the source of the influence. Propaganda is used in business for the purpose of discouraging competition. Employers use it to gain advantage over their employees. The employees retaliate by using it to gain advantage over their employers. In fact, it is used so universally and through such a smooth and beautiful streamlined technique that it looks harmless even when it is detected. I suppose some of you boys are now engaged in preparing the minds of the American people to drift into some form of dictatorship. Tell me how they work. Yes. Millions of my boys are preparing Americans to become hitlerized. My best boys are working through politics and labor organization. We intend to take over the country with ballots instead of bullets. Americans are so sensitive, they would never stand the shock of seeing their former government changed with the aid of machine guns and tank cars. So our propaganda boys are serving them a diet they will swallow by stirring up strife between employers and employees and turning the government against business and industry. When propaganda has done its work thoroughly, one of my boys will move in as dictator, and the nine old men on your Supreme Court with their silly notions of the Constitution will Okay, we lost two Everyone rounds. I just want to, at the end, when show some uh, unmanned vehicle UAV stuff. Hungry men get out from under control. I have often wondered who invented the clever trick which you call propaganda. From what you tell me of its source and nature, I understand why it is so deadly. Only one as clever as your majesty could have invented such a device with which to dull the reason, dethrone the will, and lure men into drifting. Why do you not use your powerful propaganda to gain control of your victims, instead of subduing them through fear and annihilating them through warfare? What is fear of the devil except propaganda? You have not observed my technique very carefully, or you would have seen that I am the world's greatest propagandist. I never attain an end by direct, open means which I can achieve through subterfuge and subtlety. What do you suppose I am using when I plant negative ideas in the minds of men and gain control of them through what they believe to be their own ideas? What would you call that, except the cleverest of all forms of propaganda? I'm dropping straight on that. Where is it? I don't see it. Right here? There's the uh, UAV thing. And I have the zoom feature. Operation Aphrodite. That's where I started last time. So here I'm dropping in a Hellfire missile. You can see it. Okay. Operation Aphrodite. Push the technological boundaries of radio control to new limits. Codenamed Operation Aphrodite. They will push the technological boundaries of radio control to new limits. Operation Aphrodite involved both the U.S. Army and Navy Air Forces. He was considered so dangerous they asked for pilots to volunteer. One who did was Ken Waters. They even asked pilots to volunteer? And you were volunteers for a special mission, but if you did it, You'd get credit for five missions and uh, get the D DFC, the Distinguished Flying Cross. The plan was to turn an entire warrior plane into a flying kamikaze bomb. The aircraft would be packed with nine tons of explosives. Two Daredevil pilots would then fly the plane to 10,000 feet. They would arm the bomb and bail out leaving a mother aircraft nearby to steer the bomb plane by radio control. To take an aircraft off like that that's rigged to blow up, you have to be a special person. Flight control was handed over to a bombardier in the mother aircraft. He would guide the explosive-packed plane to its target. You had to control the throttles. You had to control the climb and the dive of the aircraft. So there had to be a lot of very innovative ways to control that airplane uh, with radio control. The pilotless plane, known as the drone, trailed smoke to help the bombardier and the mother aircraft keep track of it. Two television cameras transmitted pictures of the instrument panel and the view from the flying bomb's cockpit back to the mother ship to help the bombardier's aim. The bomb 
and the mother plane between them were a whole technological revolution. Even those who flew them found it hard to understand. I think I maybe had heard about television, but this was the first television I ever saw in my life. Because the technology was new and untried, the whole operation was incredibly dangerous. Within weeks of the first flight, a pilot died when his flying bomb went out of control. Another lost his life when his parachute got entangled with the plane as he bailed out. The most dangerous part of this mission, I felt, was the jumping out of the uh, drone. We were going at probably 160, 170 mile an hour, so the slipstream threw me up against the bottom of the aircraft. Then the smoke tank flashed by my face, and it had a well seam on it. I can still see that well seam uh, flashing by my face about this far, and then I was clear. Ken Waters was one of the lucky ones. Operation Aphrodite was the claimed life of more volunteer pilots. One of them was Joseph Kennedy Jr., the eldest son of America's most famous family. He volunteered for it. And without people like that to, to go out and, and risk their lives, you're not going to know whether this technology is going to work or not. Okay, that's the end of the video, I suppose. That's quite a long video. I don't know if I'm gonna play more of that or not. I don't know.